let us begin by reading a few lines from a lecture given by Swami Vivekananda on his master, Sri Ramakrishna. The first part of my master's life was spent in acquiring spirituality and the remaining years in distributing it. Men came in crowds to hear him and you talk 20 hours in the 24 hours of the day, and that not for one day, but for months and months, until at last the body broke down under the pressure of the tremendous strain. His intense love for mankind would not let him refuse to help even the humblest of the thousands who sought his aid. Gradually, there developed a vital throat disorder, and yet he could not be persuaded to refrain from these exertions. As soon as he heard that people were asking to see him, he would insist upon ha having them admitted and would answer all their questions. When expostulated, he would reply, I do not care, I will give up 20,000 such bodies to help one man. It is glorious to help even one man. Today, the name of Sri Krishna Paramahamsa is known all over India by millions of people. Nay, the power of that man has spread beyond India. And if there has been one word of truth, a word of spirituality that I have spoken anywhere in the world, I owe it to my master only. The mistakes are mine. The subject of our talk is Sri Ramakrishna, a God intoxicated life. It was not simply a God intoxicated <coughs> life. It was a life of perfect union with God. In the highest realization of spiritual life, one finds one's identity or perfect union with God. Even in Christian theology, which, begin based, which is based on dualistic thought, we find that is in some experiences of some saints, First there is purification, then there is illumination, then there is union, identif identification with God, perfect union with God. Ramakrishna had that. He began life by worshipping the Divine Mother. To him God was Divine Mother in the form of Kali, the Goddess Kali. He had his realizations. He had realized her as a direct experience. He came to the fullest length of dualistic experiences. And at that time, there came a saint who belonged to the school of monism, who believes that ultimately one knows one's divinity so surely that one forgets one's identity altogether. It becomes complete identification. That teacher taught Ramakrishna how to practice that system of religious searching. And because Ramakrishna's field was ready, that teacher, when he gave him the instruction, and when Ramakrishna began to practice, at once he got that state of illumination, perfect identification <coughs> with the Godhead. When there is perfect identification, everything else is gone. God is everything, and you do not see anything else. You do not feel your body, nor do you feel your mind. Because with our mind, we feel that we are separate 
from others, we are separate from God. In perfect realization, one forgets everything, one becomes identified with the divine presence. His teacher was surprised that he could do that, that Sri Ramakrishna could do that. He exclaimed, is it magic? Thing which I had, for which I had to try for 40 years of hard struggle. And he got it at once. And he said, Ek doibhi maya hai. that means, is it a magic of God? That, that, that could be true. But magic was much more. He remained in that state for three hours at the first instant. When he was in that state, he was in a room. And his teacher just locked the door and went away. He came out. He, he was afraid if the door is not locked, some other person might come by chance and disturb him. And now and then he would come. But Ramakrishna was always in that state. He remained for three days in that state before he came out. He came to the normal human consciousness. But that was not all. Afterwards, he continued that experience. He would remain in that state. For six months, he remained in that state, literally. For six months, he would have no sleep. He would forget the idea of body consciousness. He would not eat. He would not drink. He had no bodily requirement. He altogether forgot the idea of this body. It is said in Vedanta scripture that if one gets that experience, one's body will fall off within three weeks, within 21 days. Because you see, you have got the knowledge of its separation from the body idea. You have realized that you are the spirit. You have realized that you are the spiritual entity, you are divine, non, uh, you are non-material, and thereby you get your complete separation from your body idea. Naturally, in that state, one cannot live long. So the general belief is one's body will fall away within 21 days. But Ramakrishna's body continued for six months. In, during that period, fortunately, there came a saint. When he came, he could at once understand that Ramakrishna's spirituality was of such a high order. Because he was continuing his life, he thought a great purpose is there. He is born to fulfill a great purpose. Great deeds will be done by this body. And he took care of him. Sometimes he would force him. Sometimes you would force him to eat his meal because he was altogether oblivious of these things. With great care, that saint kept up his body. And towards the end of that experience, towards the end of the six months, his Divine Mother told him, he'd be talking with Divine Mother as we talk with our friends and relations. His Divine Mother told him, remain on the threshold of the infinite. That means when you have realized your identity with Godhead or Divine Presence, you have become one with the infinite. If you are one with the infinite, you cannot do any work. You cannot take care of your body even. But because he had to fulfill certain purpose, the Divine Mother told him, remain on the threshold of the infinite, not at such a high pitch. Bring down your mind to some degree of lower pitch, if you can say that. It is something like, as river meets the ocean, at the mouth of the river, we do not know where the river ends and the, mouth and the ocean begins. Just at the threshold of the infinite, if we can use that expression. Because when you say infinite, there is no finiteness. But still, that means not 
don't remain at such a high sp uh, pitch. Bring down your mind to a little lower level. That is called remain just at the threshold of the infinite. Remain at the door. You can come within the, row, within the room, you can go out of the room. Just at the point where the river meets the ocean. And what does it mean to remain in that state on the threshold of the infinite? Usually we have our ego. Ego, with, we are identified with that ego. But to remain in the threshold of the infinite means your ego is gone, but your ego is of different type. Your ego means you are perfectly an instrument in the hands of God, in the hands of the Divine Mother. Your ego is gone, but you are working. You are working, not impelled by your own ideas, your desires, your purpose. You are completely identified with the purpose of God. You are, you, are, you are a perfect instrument, not an effort to become an instrument. You are a perfect instrument. So that is called on the threshold of the infinite. And the result was at that time, at that stage, you would be always in that divine ecstatic condition. No I was, uh, all sense of I was left. He was always, almost always, in that ecstatic condition. So after that experience, or the last six or eight or ten years of his life, he was always in that condition, from the one, from the many going to the one, oneness, and from the oneness coming to the condition of manifoldness. He could, not with a will, not, uh, I mean, uh, at his, uh, with a will he could do that. Or even that, it was not his will. It was, uh, he became simply an instrument in the hands of God. The result was, when he'd be talking, at any time, he would be, his mind would soar high in that state. And in that state, what would happen? He would be, to all outer experiences, dead as it were. His heart beats would stop. He would be at that time unconscious of his body idea. Sometimes a spark of fire fell on his body. He, he was not conscious of, he was not conscious of that. But his mind would come down afterwards. It is said, when you'd come down from that state, he would feel, he would, it would appear that he has come from deep sleep. Uh, 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 breathe very deeply as, as if he has come down from a state of deep sleep. As out of, to all outer uh, appearance, it seemed that he was dead as it were. But when you come, with be talking words of wisdom. That was the <coughs> state he lived for last eight or ten years. Nobody knew. He himself did not know when his mind would go high. Uh, uh, so so high up. One day he wanted to see a zoological garden. He wanted to see. Uh, he felt curious to go, and he was praying to his divine mother, "May I be able to see the zoological garden?" Because at that time, if his mind soars high, it would be difficult for him to uh, see. He was praying to the divine mother, but sometimes the divine mother would not listen even to his prayer. When he went to the zoological garden. He saw a lion. In Hindu mythology, lion, on a lion, uh, the Divine Mother rides. When he saw the lion, he thought of the Divine Mother. And instantly his mind was in a high state when he would be oblivious of the, of the surroundings. That was, the, that was his condition. So it is not a God-intoxicated state. It is not a state full of divine thoughts. It is a state of identification, union with God. Ordinary saints that ca can have one or two or few such experiences. But Sri Ramakrishna's experiences are continuous. First, he lived for six months in that state. And afterwards, at any moment, daily or every hour as it was, the mind would go, would go so high and come down to the lower, lower, lower plane for to fulfill the divine mission for which he was born, or fulfill the divine mission for which divine mother selected, selected him. That was the 
unique phenomenon. I don't know, at least there is no record in the religious history of the world that one person has such experiences. Yes, this highest state of superconscious state, one has realized once or twice or few times at best, but there is no record that one could have such experience and continuous and would live with that. Though his highest experience was a sublime, but his experiences at the lower state, if you can say that lower state, is also sweet, astonishing, and interesting. When you come down to a lower state, at the state of the finite, as it were, or on the threshold of the infinite, threshold of the infinite, at one time, at any moment, he would be identified with the infinite, and then he would come down and stay at the threshold of the infinite, at the point where the infinite existence meets with the infinite existence. At that time, he would be constantly, he would be constantly talking of the mother, of the divine mother. But at the highest state, he would be absorbed in himself. He could not talk even. And he would say, Sri Ramakrishna would say, that one should, should not be dogmatic. One should be free and elastic in <coughs> one's thoughts. So when you come down from the highest state, he would talk of the Divine Mother, and he would be, he, he would be instructing people about love for, the, love for the Divine Mother. His talks would be of, of different kind. He was, though he had the highest experience, one thing interesting, he's not rigid in his outlook. He had sympathy for all, he would encourage all. He would believe that the monistic experience is the highest, but the lower experiences are also benefi beneficial. He would say, mind goes from dualism to monism, and those who are capable from monism, that their mind comes to the dualism. He says, when you sing, you cannot always tune your pitch, uh, you tune your voice to the highest pitch. In that case, it is no song. So when you can move freely, then it is enjoyable, it is a good music. <coughs> and you would say with a ladder, you reach the floor, roof of the house, and then you have the capacity to come down and go at will. You enjoy your life. Otherwise, you, leave, you are imprisoned in the roof of the house. You are imprisoned in the highest state, but Aram Krishna could come and go up. And because of that, he could have sympathized. He could, uh, he could sympathize with all spiritual experience. He would say, God is impersonal and personal both. God is with form, God is without, uh, God is without form. He had sympathy, had love for all spiritual experience, and he could help each and one. He lived as it were in a state where the distinction between this world and another world was gone. Distinction between, between human existence, human plane of existence, and divine plane of existence was, was submerged, were together. The, all distinction between this world and other world were gone. Because he would be constantly talking with the Divine Mother as if it is a reality, as if she is a reality. With him, it was a reality, but others would be, would be surprised what he was talking, what he was, what he was uh, m muttering that way. But for him, Divine Mother was much more real than this world. There are two existence, real existence and apparent existence. There is the phenomenon, there is the noumenon. There is the divine presence, there is the material presence. And it depends to what type of persons we are, to what level of spirituality we are. There is only one existence. One is apparent and another is, another is real. Yes, psychologically, philosophically speaking, naturally the divine presence will be the real ex experience. But we do not understand that, we do not realize that. So we live in another world, the world which seems real to us, but in the ultimate analysis, which is apparent. The real world is the world of God. So Sri Ramakrishna lived in the real world, which seems simply theoretical to us. And he, he ignored that world, or he understood the apparent, understood the transitoriness of this existence 
too. We, we, we cling. So he lived in two worlds. He lived in the world of divine experience and would come down to the apparent world to help people. When you, when you read these things or when we hear these things, it seems we enter into a legendary world. Usually we talk of God and God, fortunately, is a remote reality with us. If God becomes a reality with us, our ordinary works will follow. Our ordinary works will change, and we are not ready for that. So I say, fortunately, God is a remote reality with us. But when you read his life, we feel we enter into a legendary world. Man, human being, talking with, talking with God. He would really talk with God always. He would consult his divine mother. He would discuss things with his divine mother. When, when his disciple, Swami Vivekananda, challenged his realization, he would go to the shrine and talk with the Divine Mother and, can you fool? Divine Mother said, my experiences are right. So he believed in that. He would consult, he would be under the protection of the Divine Mother, just like a child. And the Divine Mother never betrayed, never betrayed him. Divine Mother always stood by him. Yes, it becomes very difficult for a modern man to believe these things, to believe in these things. However much we read in the books, however much we have superstition of the print, we challenge, we feel, uh, we feel uncomfortable, we feel doubtful whether these things are true. Well, we need not be skeptic about these things. In his lifetime he was challenged by the stalwarts of his time. Some persons would say that he was a brain sick person, a, a, a member of uh, Brahma Samaj, Protestant school of Hinduism, a leader of Brahma Samaj, came to Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna loved him very much. And he was very much devoted to Ramakrishna. And once he t- said to one of his friends that it is a state of mental disorder. That word came to Ramakrishna through uh, some intermediary. And Ramakrishna was like a child. When that Gentleman came, that leader came, Ramakrishna said, Is it a fact you say that my mind is out of order? I constantly think of the Divine Mother, which is consciousness, pure. I am, my mind is out of disorder, out of order, and you people, who always indulge in sense objects, and who always are after material things, who are engrossed in material life, do you think yours is a normal life? and mind is out of order. Not only that, almost each one of his disciples who came challenged Ramakrishna, because most of them were university people. They had that imbibe the skeptical attitude of modern education. They challenged, they challenged him, and, and they got the concrete proofs, at least they saw the power of that life. That life which can be so powerful can never be brain sick. Swami Vivekananda challenged him for six years. It would be hard for Ramakrishna even to convince that these things were real experiences. And afterwards, Swami Vivekananda surrendered himself completely to him. There was another disciple, lay disciple, Grishchandra Ghosh, a great dramatist. He was the creator of Bengal theater, a great writer and playwright. He not only challenged, he was definitely rude to Ramakrishna. He could not believe, he would say that these things are all feigning. But Ramakrishna was, was so very kind towards him. And afterwards, he, we, he won over that uh, disciple, that uh, gentleman, and afterwards he would become, he, would, he was almost fanatical about, in his devotion to Ramakrishna. He would speak so highly about Ramakrishna, and in such a way, even now one would think his, fanat- his devotion is fanatical. So these things, these things were challenged. We need not challenge anymore. And challenged by persons who are persons of higher intellectual order than our, many, of, many of us. Once, uh, some of his uh, disciples, as I said, were English educated persons. Last monastic disciple of Ramakrishna died in the year 1938. 
He was a scientist and engineer and a very brilliant scholar. He came into contact with Ramakrishna. Something happened, interesting. At that time, he was young, 18 years old. He was very healthy. And Ramakrishna liked him, his health, and said, can you listen, with, can you wrestle with me? And he was very bored. He said, ah, yes, I will try. And he, they wrestled, and Ram, he pushed Ramakrishna to the wall. But even Ramakrishna said, yeah, I have been, I have become weak because of dysentery. Otherwise, you could not do that. But it wasn't the question of his winning. That disciple says, and afterwards I felt something within me, and it changed my whole outlook on life. That is the thing. It was not wrestling. He, when he touched and when he came, he did that thing. He said that something happened at that time. I felt that something had happened. So Ramakrishna was challenged by each one of his, each one of his disciples and had the experiences. One thing, one simple thing we forget. We can study the life of a political leader. A scientist can life, study the life of a scientist. But we cannot study, the, we are not capable of studying the life of a spiritual man because we have not the spiritual qualification to study and judge. We may write something, we may read, do, do historical uh, researches. This man, this disciple said these things, this disciple said these things, and that is the philosophy and, and, and so on, that is the psychology and so on. We do not understand anything about the life of a spiritual person, especially of, of a saint. How can we? We are incapable. We have not got in, gone in that way. But still, because of modern education, we feel self con we feel considered, we feel proud of our intellectual acumen, and we criticize. But fundamentally, it is impossible to judge the life, uh, to, uh, judge the life of a saint for ordinary persons, however scholarly we, uh, they may be. Spiritual persons can be judged only by those who have spiritual equipment. It is natural, it is common sense, who are also spiritually high. See, Ramakrishna could be understood, uh, it, uh, it could be understood only by those persons who have spiritual equipment. Even the disciples of Ramakrishna would say, one of them said, in his old age, Did, we, did I know at that time that in the human frame such spiritual power could exist? At that time I was caught in his love. That was all, and I followed his instruction. But now, with the passage of time I find, I am overwhelmed with the idea that so much power could be encased in a human frame. That is exactly the thing. And he would say, after I was doing the spiritual practices almost throughout my whole life, then we find a little of what he was. So Vivekananda challenged him in the early days of his life when he came into contact with him. Afterwards, he would say, he would not dare write the life of Ramakrishna. It was the only lecture he gave about Ramakrishna. It was delivered in New York, from which I uh, read in the beginning. Somebody requested him, a great friend of Sam Vivekananda requested him to write the life of Ramakrishna. He said, brother, you can, I, I shall comply, comply with any other request you make, but life of Ramakrishna I, I would not dare write. He would say that I have not understood one million part of what he was. It was a mystery. But this much I can say, the more you discuss, the more you study his life, you will be benefited, but I have not understood, I have not understood one millionth part of, one millionth part of what he is. Really, when you read and say, he had a super conscious state, he stayed in that state uh, for six months and so on. This is easy to say, this is easy to repeat, but we do not know what super conscious state is. And we do not know, the, we cannot judge the tremendous power of a person who could remain in that state for six months completely, and even after that, always going to that high state. So it is impossible for others to judge. No wonder we say extravagant, we say, we pass very proud judgment, as if we know, as if we know everything. It can be done only by spiritual personalities. It happened in the lifetime of Ramakrishna. 
Fortunately, there came a great saint, a woman saint. Ramakrishna was passing through, through that state, and people are worried about him. They would give um, medicine. He had some physical ailments because the body could not stand the pressure of such spiritual struggle. He was suffering from various physical ailments. But doctors, the best physicians, could not do any good to him. Just at that time came that woman saint. As soon as he saw him and he said, what, do, what are you doing? This is not a physical malady. It is a spiritual malady. And she could say that at that time. In him there is tremendous degree of spiritual power. Because of that he is suffering so much physically. And she gave some directions and he was, he was cured. There came another saintly person and a great scholar in Hindu scripture. There came three great uh, scholars and they were saintly characters, religious persons, not simply dry scholarship they had. And they recognized him. They, from the scriptures they could find. These are the directions, these are the indications of a highly spiritual soul. And they recognized at that time that he is a person of extraordinary spiritual power. One, say, one of these scholars said, in him we find embodied the spiritual truths which are in all in our Hindu uh, scriptures in all the Vedas. And you would say that he has transcended the limitation of the truths in the Vedas. His experiences gone, gone farther than that. Some Vivekananda would say, and literally, because Ramakrishna practiced almost all the systems, spiritual systems, of Hinduism, and Hinduism has so many sects, has so many uh, uh, systems. He uh, uh, practiced almost all of them, and as such, Saint Vivekananda says, Ramak said that Ramakrishna's life embodied the spiritual experiences of Hindu religion for five thousand years. It was it was it was literally true. It was not simply rhetoric or exaggeration. Yes. Some, of, some disciple of Swami Vivekananda once said, not to him, in his uh, right inside mind, he said, when Swami Vivekananda would say these things, I would feel perhaps it was the exaggeration of a, uh, of a disciple about his master. Then afterwards I find Swami, Kishnu, uh, Swami Vivekananda as a person who was so sincere and who was so strictly uh, loyal to truth that he would, not, he would not say anything which is not perfectly, perfectly right. Such was the life. As I said, it was not a life of God intoxication. It was not a simply God intoxicated life. It was a life of union with, with God as it were. Now, what was the lesson? And what are his teachings? <coughs> Towards the end of his life, he would be, as I read, he would be talking and talking of spiritual things to people. One thing interesting, after he has finished his spiritual practices, <coughs> he would be crying for the coming of the devotees. Literally, in the evening, he would live in a temple. In the evening, there is evening service. There is hymn, uh, hymns are sung uh, uh, with uh, musical instruments and so on. At that time, it was evening, he would go to the roof of a neighboring house. And from there he would be crying aloud, where are those persons for whom I am waiting? The implication is, or the understanding is, when a person rises to a high spiritual height, he becomes so eager to share his experiences with others. He becomes so eager to hand over his experiences to others. Usually many persons, not thinking deeply enough, say that spiritual pursuits is a life of selfishness. But it is just the opposite. Whenever has a man 
has succeeded in a spiritual life. He is so eager to share his experiences with others, to hand over his experiences uh, to others. And in Ramakrishna's case, it, was, it became a mental agony. He was literally crying and, uh, and looking towards the Calcutta from that roof of the house. He would be literally crying, where are those for whom I am waiting? When Swami Vivekananda came, Ramakrishna said, why did you delay so long? I am waiting for you. And when the disciples began to come, he picked them up. He was, wait, he was waiting for each one of them. And at the end of his future, uh, the last few years of his life was simply giving those instructions, those ex experiences to others. But what are the message, what are the teachings of Ramakrishna? What do we learn from his experiences? And you see, when, you have, when one has the direct experience, one can make his teachings very simple. The first thing, most important thing was, spiritual experiences can be realized, spiritual knowledge can be or has to be realized directly, independent of any secondary help. Intellectual knowledge we get through books, but spiritual knowledge, real spiritual knowledge, you would not get through the study of scriptures. It must be done, it must be got as a direct experience. It must be the first-hand knowledge, no second-hand knowledge, no knowledge by proxy through a teacher. Even however great the spiritual teacher, even if you get instructions from him, you have to practice and get the experience directly. So book learning has no value in spiritual life. He would say book learning is something like a record, something like a sleep to uh, giving directions to do certain things. Sleep cannot achieve that work. You have to do the work. So his own experience was, he, he was quite innocent of book learning. And perhaps he was quite innocent of book learning. He could go directly to get the first hand information of highest truth. So books, have no, books are simply uh, disturbances. One has to go direct to the source of all knowledge. After all, she would say, if you get a ray of light from the goddess of learning or from the source of all learning, one ray is enough, it will silence all scholarship. Ramakrishna did that. When he was teaching, when he was preaching, scholars, leaders of thought would come to him. And he would be talking and they would be just sitting like children before him, drinking literally the words which fell from his lips. There was one leader, Keshav Chandra Sen, he would sway thousands of persons by his lecture. But when he came to Ramakrishna, he sat silent, just like a child. And Ramakrishna did the most did most of the talking. Uh, uh, did most of the talking. When people would be coming, he would be talking. They could not. Uh, they felt so humble, rather so insignificant before him. That is the reward of spiritual exp of experience. But what was his direct teaching? His teaching was. His teaching was so simple, though you find very hard to uh, understand it or believe it or put into practice. His first teaching was, life is in vain if we do not realize God. Human life is a great opportunity. If we do not, uh, if we do not realize, if we are not able to realize life in this, uh, uh, God in this life, life is, has become a great failure. He was simply echoing the Upanishadic saying. In Upanishadic, there is a saying, the man who has not been able, the person who has not been able to realize the imperishable being is an object of pity. One who has not been able to realize God in this life is an object of pity. And in another passage in the Upanishad, there it says, in this life one has to realize the truth. If you do not do that, your life is a great failure. In Upanishadic sayings, we find uh, Upanishadic sayings were spoken in Sanskrit language. Ramakrishna said in a simple Bengali language, life is in vain. That is the most important thing in life. All other things have no value. 
even works. He had so much compassion for, uh, for all. But even Ramakrishna says, works are secondary things. Works are simply the means to an end. The end is the realization of God. All other things are of secondary importance. Try to realize God, and that is the most important thing in life. Now, how to do that? He makes things so simple. And he said, if you are sincere, if there is harmony between your words and your thoughts and your deeds, and you pray to the Divine Mother or pray to your conception of God, it will be easy. It will be easy to realize God if you, have, if you have the earnestness, if you are sincere. All our spiritual practices, all our spiritual drilling are necessary to create sincerity of purpose, to create spiritual sincerity in our being. We are not, uh, we are not honest enough for spiritual realization. So Ramakrishna said in such a simple way that if you are sincere enough, if you have love for God, if you are honest enough, then it will be easy. And how to get that if we have not, we, if we have not that? He said, cultivate the association of holy person. Go to a solitary place and discriminate what you are doing, what is real and what is unreal, what is eternal and what is transitory. His teachings are so simple. Of course, it is difficult to follow them into practice. But his idea was, first, try to realize God in this very life. Life is in vain, you have not realized God. It will be easy for you to realize God if, if you are sincere. But if you have not spiritual yearning, just to cultivate the companion of holy person who have known God. You are fortunate if you, are, if you find such a person. Or try to discriminate always what is real. What is unreal? What is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? That way you, de uh, that way you develop your spiritual life. Ramakrishna did sp sp tremendous spiritual practices for long, 12 years, and it was a severe spiritual practices. In the early days, when he was praying to the Divine Mother, and sometimes uh, in great uh, anguish, he would rub his face on the ground and the Divine Mother, another day is gone, but still I have not realized thee. Just imagine what should be the agony of a person who could do that. And in this way, all his spiritual practices were tremendous. Now, what, why did he undergo such spiritual practices? What is the reason for that, for his doing so much spiritual practices? It is said afterwards he realized, Ramakrishna realized, that it was his spiritual practices were for the good of humanity, for the good of others. In what way did it, uh, did it do good to others and are likely to do good? You see, it happens that way. By his spiritual practices, he showed before us that God can be realized in this very life. Not only did he preach, his life was a great much more teacher than his words. In his life, he realized as a direct experience what he was teaching. And because he realized the truths in his life, and others could see that it is possible for us to do likewise. In that way, in that way also, his spiritual practices were for the good of others. In, in some other sense also, Ramakrishna used to say, you kindle a fire and others will come in windy nights to get warmed. A spiritual saint, a spiritually great person, by spiritual practices, he kindles a great spiritual fire so that others may come and bask in the warmth of that, of that fire. And the greater the intensity of the fire, the greater will be the longer will be the time which will last and which will give spiritual help to, uh, to, to thousands of, of persons. And what was the method of his teaching? His method of teaching was fasting his life. Be, even before people heard his words, they would be impressed by his, 
by by uh, by looking at him, by looking at him, one could easily see that here is a person who did not belong to this world. There came a great Sanskrit scholar to him, and after talking with Ramakrishna for some time, he says, "I studied scriptures for such a long time. By meeting him, I find a new meaning into all I." have studied. There came the founder of a religion, a great saint. He has a large following now. He met with Ramakrishna. And when he, met, when he spoke with him, he said, after the word, uh, yeah, he said to Ramakrishna, we are simply getting the buttermilk, but you have, got the, you have got the butter itself. And when they would come into contact with him, they could see, they could feel that he was, that they were near a, spirit, near a spiritual fire. And constantly speaking, when people would be coming to give instructions, but his instructions was so simple, so easy to understand, but though difficult to follow. But one thing more important was, they could find his mind would constantly go high up. He could, they could see that there is no dividing line between heaven and earth. Sometimes even he would be praying to the Divine Mother, there would be so earnest, so sincere, a new tone, new meaning, and people would get inspiration from, uh, from the very sight of him. They would get help from his words, they would get inspiration from the very sight of him. Sometimes when you did pray in such a pathetic way, though he had not to pray for himself because he has reached the, because he had reached the highest pinnacle of spiritual life, but still he would be praying, praying for others, just to show to others how to pray. He would pray in such a pathetic tone, give me oh, devotion, give me devotion, unselfish devotion, oh Divine Mother. And when people would see these things, they could get the, inf they could get the contagion in that way he, he preached. But the most important of his teaching was that all religions are true. It was for the first time in the history of the world a saint through his personal experiences, showed that all religions are true. He practiced Hinduism in, in all his systems. He practiced Christianity, he had the vision of Christ, and he practiced Islam. And from his direct experience, he came to the conclusion that all religions are true. If he said anything new, it was the important thing, that don't disturb the faith of any person. Let each one grow in his own way. He would not disturb the faith, faith even of an agnostic. There came a person to Ramakrishna and asked, what can I do that I do not believe in God? Ramakrishna did not get annoyed, simply said, pray to God that I do not believe in you. I cannot understand that you exist. Just give us the right understanding. And that man afterwards uh, changed in his spiritual, his spiritual outlook. So much compassion. So much Catholicity uh, uh, of ideas and, 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 and so on. Sam Vivekananda said, he, he wrote in an article, Bengali article, towards the end of the last century, it might be 1898. He said, even in that time, Ramakrishna had passed away something like 12 years. He said, even so close to his life, we find his message has become so powerful and it is spreading with so much intensity. We cannot imagine what will be the effect as years pass by. That happens when there is a great spiritual force, spiritual power, its message in intensity and extensity began to increase and increase. But what was the lesson to us, simple lesson from his, from his life? One simple thing is that we can see that in this human body, one can rise to such a spiritual height. We cannot deny that so much power was involved, so much power was hidden in that human frame. That is a matter of great hope and encouragement to us. We can find that human, with human body, 
one can rise to a, such a spiritual height. That makes us emboldened to aspire after spiritual progress. That gives us the conviction that spiritual life is the only life that matters. You have to live intense, in, intensely. That is a great lesson. A spiritual saint is born, a spiritual prophet, or divine power comes to this earth just to give us a push in our spiritual life when you forget all spiritual, life, uh, spiritual ideas and when we wallow in darkness. When you grow up in darkness, light comes that way from the infinite mercy of God. Such was the life Ramakrishna lived.